We've taken a short break and we've returned refreshed, ready for anything. And we asked, do you have any questions for us? And well, yes, it turns out you do. Loads. So let's get straight into it. We've broken this down into the following categories. That is travel, YouTube, retirement, general, and we're going to round it all off with some meaty questions about money. Where are we starting, Sarah? We are starting on travel and we have a question from Greg B. If you had to pick from anywhere you've been so far to settle down, where would that be? And more importantly, how's Tansy doing? <laughs> so let's start with where we would want to be. Now, I asked this question to Sarah earlier and I already had my answer written down. And actually, we agreed yeah, a we whole do. hundred percent on mm, it. Interesting. So what were the locations we came up with? We said Queretaro in Mexico and Izmir in Turkey. And I said possibly Fethiye in Turkey. Exactly. Can't agree enough. So although Izmir isn't really like a holiday location, it really feels like a town you can live in. Yeah. And if you look back at our Izmir video, you'll see that things like the transport system there was absolutely out of this world. Mm. And Caletero felt exactly the same way. We've been to San Miguel de Ande, loved San yes. Miguel de Ande, but Caletero feels more like a city yeah. that we would enjoy living in. So that's our top choice. And as for Tansy, mm -hmm. well, we've got some good news. It seems like we may have found the perfect home for her. We don't want to tempt fate by telling you who or what or where. Once it happens, you'll be the first to know. The next question from JFK540. Now I have to keep looking down because we've had 30 odd questions and they're all on the laptop here. <laughs> so JFK540 says, what would you say if someone wants to have the same amount of fun we're having, but they're solo travellers? Is it possible or is it a crazy idea? Sarah? Well, our strap line is live an intentional life. And we would definitely say, don't rush into it. Make sure you do your research, know what it is that you want to do and get involved in groups and really research before you go. We met people along the way who are solo travellers mm. and they don't regret it at all. So it's doable. You can have lots of fun. You'll meet lots of friends and just do your research. Yeah, probably the, the solo travellers we've met don't regret it, but all the ones that did regret it have all gone home. <laughs> so Sarah's right, do your research, but I can't add any more to that. Right, on to the next question. Next question from Annette Robinson, and that is, how do you figure out public transport, travel cards, when to tap on and off for each destination? Is there an app or website that is good to go and help with each location stroke country? Right, this one's easy to answer, <laughs> and that is... There's no easy way to answer <laughs> no. it. Everywhere we go to is different, and we feel that's actually part of the yeah, fun. We sure. like arriving in a place and finding that we don't have all yeah. the answers. When we went to Istanbul, it actually became a quest. I felt like we were in an episode yeah. of Lord of the Rings or something <laughs> like that, because trying to find this card called the Istanbul cart that gets you onto public transport wasn't easy. It took us two days yeah. to get it. And we do feel that really is actually fun. What we will do before we get there, we obviously we try and research, we look yeah, at blogs, blogs and that kind of stuff to try and find, or look for, probably we always put something, for example, Istanbul local transport system, and you'll get yeah, and like the of, local train company, their details yeah, will be there. Yeah, and, and part of, of that is when we're looking at accommodation, we always make sure we know that it's got some local transport that we can at least use. And on to the next one, we've actually had a number of people asking this, and they are Alicio Salcedo, Ian Smith and Ian Whittaker and that is what are you currently thinking for your next stage of travel i.e back to Chiang Mai from martial arts or a totally new adventure so that's the question and we're going to be honest with you it's looking highly unlikely that we will be returning back to Chiang Mai to finish our self-defense training basically it feels like our time in Chiang Mai was a little bit um, jinxed. jinxed yeah <laughs> so we we started the training then we both got COVID separately. So that left us out of action for over a month and because a, we also a parasite, got a, yeah. a parasite. The yeah. other thing was when we started, we and we had no, no view that there was going to be COVID or any mm. serious issue back in the UK. We booked ourselves a little two-week break to go down to the islands and we yeah. made a video about that. So it was start. And then we thought we'd be doing it for probably about two months before that happened. Mm -hmm. As it was, we were doing it for about a month. 
then the COVID thing. And then we went back for a couple of weeks and then we went down to the islands. Yeah. And then we did a few more weeks and then this happened and we're in the UK. We're gonna to touch on that in a later question actually, but there's a video we're making that will probably be out in about a month's time which will go into this in a lot more detail. That isn't to say we're never going to do it. Yep. We've made a commitment to mm -hmm. each other that we are going to be doing that self-defense training at some point in the future. And to all the guys at Core Combat in Chiang Mai, we miss you. Yeah. You guys are doing a <laughs> phenomenal job. Next, still in travel, is from the Flair Guy, and he asks that he's sure it's been covered in previous videos, but he hasn't seen what healthcare plan we use while we're travelling. We use Safety Wing, and the reason we chose Safety Wing is because of its simplicity. It's easy to turn off and on as we're travelling around, and the support we get from them is absolutely fantastic. It's all web-based. Really, yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. There is a link in the description below, so if you do want to look into it and sign up through our link, we will get a little something from that. Well, that's not why we told you no. that. It's because <laughs> that is what we use. We love Simple as that. <laughs> Mary Ann C asks, interested in the UK as a long stay destination. I've seen YouTube videos on the visa process, but not much on where to consider staying, i.e., locations that are friendlier to stay long term, less expensive areas to consider, etc, etc. Most of what I've seen from England's places to see in London and typical tourist stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So we are making some UK content about places to stay, but isn't probably exactly what you're looking for. So yeah. let me just give you a bite sized ready reckoner and everybody in the UK you can hit me in the comments with everything <laughs> I'm about to get wrong. People in the north are friendlier than the people in the south. I'm speaking about that coming from the south and having lived a time in the and north. And being, I'm from the north. Yeah, they, well, she's from the Midlands, <laughs> halfway. The cost of living in the north is lower than it is in the south. As for beauty, if you look at Scotland, all of Scotland is yeah. beautiful. Wales is also beautiful extremely coastline. beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and Wales, the, the south and yeah. west coast of Wales, absolutely gorgeous. Northern Ireland, we don't know Never too been. much about Northern Ireland. We want to go there, but everything we've seen looks incredible. There are places such as the Peak District, the Lake District, the Yorkshire Dales, the Derbyshire Dales, all wonderful places. People in the UK, when they go on vacation, they generally head south down to Dorset, Devon, and Cornwall. And if you're further up north, you tend to go to places like Skegness or over to uh, just north of Blackpool. The UK is far more diverse in respect to the type of people you're likely to meet, the landscape you're gonna see, and the cities and towns. And we recommend seeing all of it. And if you do, and if you've written down everything I've just said, <laughs> you will have a far more interesting stay in the UK than all those people that head straight to London. If you do head straight to London though, we made two videos in London that no one was bothered to watch. No, right. And they're fantastic. Go and check them out. Laurie Thornton asks us, what country is still top of our bucket list as a place to visit? So we asked each other this earlier and we decided to write down which countries, with two countries actually, are still on our bucket list. And we came up with the same country on one of them, haven't we? We have. Which is? Argentina. Buenos Aires is a place that we both can't wait to get to. There's somebody we used to know who's now sadly no longer with us and she is from Buenos mm. Aires and she used to tell us so yeah. many interesting stories about that wonderful city and it would have been lovely for us to tell her that we've yeah. been. The yes. second one for me was Bulgaria. I'm really excited to yeah. go to Sofia and Plovdiv. And for you Sarah? New Zealand, just to do a tour around the whole whole country so <laughs> yeah both both islands, both and, islands it's, yes. and it's still on the list yeah. we know we've got viewers from New Zealand watching who we're in touch with regularly and we are going to come down there yes. don't worry we'll be there <laughs> at some point and the next question is from Claire Rainbird and she asks you mentioned that you planned the next few Thailand videos how about doing a UK version of those subjects May not be possible, but could be very amusing. <laughs> what does she know that? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, Claire, really, really interesting idea. And if we had more time, we probably would make those videos here. We are making a series of videos, and there's a part that we're making from the UK we're going to be using in our world series going forward but you're just going to have to wait and see what that is. <laughs> we're not going to tell you what it is. Even when we see you next week, you can ask us. We're not going to tell you. All right? Owen asks... 
If Thailand is unlikely to be our next destination, what is our number one future destination? It's got to be Southeast Asia because there's so much still to see there and do. You know, we've got unfinished business there, so we, we definitely will be going back. And also from a geo-arbitrage point of view, it's the best place to be currently. Yeah, very cost effective. <laughs> and the next one from Jill Krolik is, has anyone else asked you about whether you understood in the planning stages that being child free would make it an easier game well undoubtedly being child free makes it easier but we do still have family and that you know obviously that's a challenge that we've been dealing with most recently but i I would say that everybody has their own set of challenges Mm -hmm. and there's not one challenge that's greater more complex than another i think it all comes down to how much you want it yeah so that's all of the questions from travel We're rattling through at a pretty good pace, (laughs) and we're now moving on to a couple of questions we've had about our YouTube channel. Ian Whitaker asks, how are we going to change our YouTube style going forward? That's in style, content, and frequency. So frequency, no change, and style, we're always flexing that. The content will always be retirement and finance, and we obviously do like to put a bit of humour in there when we can. Yeah, so we're going to try and level up the humour, really. (laughs) And then a question from Dylan Blunt. Well, actually, we've got a couple of questions from Dylan. And the first one was, do you think you would be just as happy if you didn't run a YouTube channel? I'm sure it adds to the challenge and helps you keep occupied. It certainly does. (laughs) It certainly does. And really, YouTube is a bit of a double-edged sword. There are friends of ours who run a a much bigger YouTube channel than ours, in fact. (laughs) And we were having dinner with them in Istanbul a few months ago. And they came up with a concept which I thought was really funny but so true. (laughs) And that is they look at YouTube as a child. So if they're out having dinner, they'll be eating (laughs) and then they'll say... Has YouTube got everything it needs? Oh, no, no. I want to get a bit of B-roll of this, a bit of B-roll of that. Yeah, we can relate to that. It is like carrying a child around with you that you have to keep feeding and giving it what it needs. Keep giving it attention. But this does absolutely feed us from a creative perspective and keeps us more than busy. So, yeah, I think we, we would agree it does do all of that for us from that perspective. Dylan also asked another question. I watch a couple of other channels, normally younger travellers, and they swear by carry-on only like luggage. What are your (laughs) thoughts on that? Would you ever convert, Sarah? Would we ever convert? Oh, my God. We are in the middle of Mm. this eye of the storm right now, aren't we? We We are. are working out now what can we take on our next travels and what what can we leave behind just to make it easier for us? Are we going to go down the carry on only route? Or yeah. aren't we? Yeah, <laughs> so we, we both got different opinions yeah. and we were in a shop yesterday with a bag and we were stood there half an hour Easy. talking about the bag and it became a lot more of a philosophical discussion about bags by the end of it we, <laughs> and we didn't buy it even though it had a 50% discount on a bag we thought we wanted. It really is complicated. I think we both love to go carry on only. The challenge though is when you look at some of the airlines they have such tight yeah. restrictions one of the restrictions we were discussing yesterday is although you can fit a lot into yeah. a into a bag into an overhead bin some of them are saying yeah fit as much in there as you want eight kilos is your limit and so to carry around your all of your belongings including camera equipment it's just eight kilos which just isn't do- doable yeah our camera all. equipment weighs yeah. more than your eight laptop kilos. weighs about that yeah exactly <laughs> so that's the big challenge mm. thinking where we may be ending up is having one checked bag yeah and the rest is carry on but we'll see and let us know if you want us to share when we start traveling again exactly what it is we yeah. got with us now we're moving into the retirement questions and the first one is from doug rattray and that is, what do you tell people you meet on your travels when they ask, what do you do? My wife and I have just retired at 42 and 46. We were asked that question by someone. And when my wife replied that we were retired, we got very self-conscious. It felt a bit like we were bragging. We get that. Yeah, we we feel exactly the same yeah. way. And certainly when you're in a lower cost of living country, if you say we've retired, mm. it It's a bit of a kick in the teeth, really, isn't it? Mm. So we try and steer away from that. We would say that we're travelling, and that can can mean many things. So we're travelling. 
or that we're YouTubers. That's a nice get yeah, out of jail yeah. free card that we can play. Yeah. There's also an interesting thing about saying you're YouTubers. It's almost like it's a bit of a down <laughs> downgrade for people to say. When when you say to people you're YouTubers, generally they go, oh, right, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then what they are, ask you what your what channel that, is. That lot. And then you tell them and they go, oh, right, you're not, right. You're not going to write it down. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think they're wondering whether they've just met Cara yeah, and Nate right, or yeah. something. And we tell them, they go, oh, yeah, mm, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So we get that. But this is the same for anyone that retires at any age, really, mm. because we know, and we, we discussed this on a video when we were in Turkey, yeah. that many people actually identify themselves by their profession. Like, you know, my name's Dave. I'm a plumber from Tamworth. <laughs> oh, oh, where, 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 where I got that from. But <laughs> Dave, if you're a plumber from Tamworth, what are you going to do when you retire? You're no longer plumbing and you're in Thailand. What is it you say to people? <laughs> Because it's not so much about what you're saying, but it's what you feel. Because yeah. this is a bit of a mental game as well. We've all got to think about that mm -hmm. when we retire. We're not what we used to be. We've had two questions that are very similar. One from Melody Lees asking, after the 10 years of travel, do you plan to make a remote destination your permanent home? And Mrs. Q as, cute as what? I don't know. <laughs> kitten. Kitten. Probably, yeah, cute as a kitten. <laughs> Mrs. Q as a kitten asks, what happens after the fun stops? 10 years of travel, are you planning to buy or rent a place of residence? So, yes, we don't know what or where, and we're unlikely to buy anything again I think but we don't know we don't know and we're unlikely to be settling in the UK but we don't we know, don't know. <laughs> so well, it's, it's, it's just like a long-term yeah, location exactly. hunt for yeah, us exactly. isn't it so stick around for 10 years you'll find out <laughs> question from traveling squirrel we love that name don't we mm. <laughs> i always think traveling squirrel will, he will be doing fast travel not slow travel yeah, that's true. Will, scurry around all over the place order the hibernate do you hibernate interesting what's the question <laughs> anyway as i prepare to enter retirement i am reading that you need to have things that keep your brain and body busy is a youtube channel and slow travel planning meeting this need anything else that you are doing to keep yourselves busy yeah, so we're actually <laughs> making a video targeting this specific point and it's probably, it's not going to be ready for a couple of months. So please do stick around for that one because we think that's going to be one of yeah. our best pieces of work. Mm -hmm. Quite excited about that one <laughs> in particular. But yes, YouTube is keeping us more than busy mm. and our minds ticking over. And then when you look at slow travel, slow travel is just a series of challenges. Every day there's something yes. different that you've not had to attack before. Yeah. And that keeps your mind very, very active. So yeah, absolutely, it does. We're now moving into more general questions. And the first one, a really, really good question, actually, from Scott Gallant, who asks, why are you two so awesome? <laughs> we, we question ourselves we on do, that we, all the yeah. time. We don't know. We don't if... know. <laughs> Next, though, a question from DD2015. Now, DD2015, we said, ask us anything. We didn't say, <laughs> ask us everything. And that's what you've done. So I'm going to ask all these questions and then let's just nail it one okay, at a time, Sarah. Okay. Quick so, fire. So DD2015 <laughs> has asked, how do you access your money while travelling abroad? We do that ATMs. really with ATMs. We have a bank account in the UK which enables you to take money out and use it overseas and there's no charge for that. And we do a research on the best ATM as far as the, the charges you get for taking yeah, money out. Yeah, so we don't so. have any options in the UK yeah. to actually get the a refund back on ATM no. fees itself, <laughs> but we use Starling, they're great for that. We also use Revolut, we use Wise. Wise is widely available and actually gives you a bank account effectively in, in a number of different places, so that's another one that we use. We never ever go to a bureau exchange to change our cash because that's just a crazy yeah. way. And we never of use money a away. credit card abroad either unless no. it's on online and it's booking flights or something. Yeah, yeah. But we never use a credit card when we're out. Yeah, well yeah, when you say booking flights because we generally book it in UK pounds when we're booking flights. Yeah. Next, how can you ensure high speed Wi-Fi? We are unable <laughs> to ensure Wi-Fi. It's impossible. Yeah. So let's say for example, we were really shocked when we got to Athens being a major European city. The Wi-Fi in awful. Athens is awful. It's terrible. Then we went to Turkey and it was much better and in Thailand was incredible. And then we come Southeast Asia is 
incredible for its then you come to the UK, and, just, yeah. <laughs> and I was sat in a supermarket car park last week, uploading a video, because that was the best place <laughs> I could get. Next one, have you ever booked a hotel or Airbnb and realised that the accommodation was less than stellar and had to leave? Nearly, in... Athens? Nearly in Athens. We booked an Airbnb that was very, very dark. Very dark. I walked in and just, you saw by my you, face. Yeah, Sarah wanted but... to walk out again. I'm thinking, ooh, I've paid a month <laughs> for this. So I convinced Sarah to stay. And we went and bought some home comforts. Yeah, we just made it, it homely. Nicer, but... Got some nice little twinkling lights yeah. and just made it homely. <laughs> it was over Christmas. There was a place that we left. Do you remember what really? that was? Yeah, I didn't think you did. So when we were in Turkey, we're not going to call it out because actually they were wonderful people. Oh, yeah, but we were in a little village in Turkey and when we looked yeah. at booking the room there, you could book a standard room for about $8, I think, and they had a suite for about $12. Including, it was out of season, so... Including we breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> and it had a swimming pool and the photographs looked really good. We got there. It's a, it's a family-run place. Lovely, lovely family. Lovely yes, family. Yes, no. We got to our um, suite, and first of all, was it freezing cold or really Freezing hot? cold. Freezing cold. Then the water didn't work. Yes. I got in the shower yeah, in the morning, the and then no I just burst out laughing because I turned the shower on. <laughs> so we had Nothing. to we had to have a washout. We boiled some water in the saucepan, didn't we? <laughs> so I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. we were okay. supposed to be there for a few days, nah. but we made our excuses. Yes. We didn't get our money back because they were lovely people, to be yeah, honest. We and we, yeah. we just made an excuse and said, "Oh, we need to move on early." <laughs> so that's the only that's the only two I can think of yes. anyway. You you mentioned you need to address your health. Does that mean walking was not enough? Walking in Southeast Asia is a real challenge because yes. of the humidity and the heat. That's been difficult. And really disappointed that we couldn't walk around and it's you know, that's something we absolutely love to do in anywhere we go. Yeah. We love walking and, and some some cities we we walk forever, don't we? Yeah. But, uh, Athens yeah. is a great example. Yeah. We walked so, everywhere in Athens. Yeah. We we didn't actually use public transport, do we? No. We, yeah. No, we didn't. Taxi for really long journeys. Do we also need to monitor what we consume? Yes. Do we? No. We have to you have to, in life, generally, you have to monitor what yeah. you consume. We haven't been so particularly healthy the last been, couple of years. And we no. need to step that up. Yeah. Trying to get through this quick, okay, Sarah, because you've yes. got so many questions yes. here. Um, <laughs> do you need to add strength training and stretching? Yes, because my shoulders, yeah. I need stretching yes. training. So, yes, yes we you do. do. You're both so thorough in your planning, but are you realising there are other considerations to prepare for? And does this hiatus in our travel help us to fine-tune our already well-laid plans? Yeah, yes. actually. Yeah. It's given us a chance to talk to each other about what we like and what we don't like about travel. And it's that only is since we've come something... back we've actually sat down and thought about it. Yeah. So. And I've said that there's something we're going to address in a later video around travel and Chiang Mai and that kind of stuff. This relates to the same things. So we'll, we'll include that in that video when we get to it, which will be in about a month's time. <laughs> that was a lot of questions, DD 2015. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Please, everyone didn't do what you did. Yeah. Right, we're going to continue now with a question from Owen saying, always about the gadgets. How might your tech change going forward? What will you be keeping or ditching? So I'll cover this because I'm the tech guy. Yeah. I have an issue, Owen, and that is I worked in resiliency, so that means <laughs> everything I've got, I've got two of. So power banks, I've actually got three power banks. Hard drives, I've actually got three hard drives, so I've got primary a secondary and a tertiary of those. When it comes to cables, I have about 10 of every kind of cable. When it comes to tripods, I've got five or six different tripods. Cameras, we've got four. So what I'm trying to yeah. do is slim all this down so that it doesn't weigh a yes. ton. And actually, what we're talking to you on here is a brand new camera sat on a brand new yes. tripod. So what I'm doing is selling another camera and tripod to make space for this in our pack. Also, the laptop I travel with is a high-performance one for uh, editing videos. And it weighs a ton. Yeah, it does. Another question from Owen, Sarah. You can answer this one. Okay. Might we cut back on YouTube to more infrequent but longer episodes for the love of the content rather constrained by weekly... It's a B, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a B. All right, mate. All right. Not looking for any trouble. <laughs> There's a wasp I've been out of here. <laughs> Rather than be constrained to a weekly publishing format. Right. So we will always stick to the one week schedule because that's what we want to do. Yeah. And the longer videos actually can take far too long to edit, can't they? And yeah. It's, it's actually that whether a video is short or long 
doesn't matter. No. Sometimes you can have a really long video, as, like this is going to be dead easy to yeah. edit. This is a long video. But then you can have a really short video that takes so long to yeah. edit because there's a lot of complexity in it. Yeah, we're going to stick to the same schedule, but what we're going to do is just up the quality of our output. We're always wanting to improve. Hence so, this new camera, so yeah, that's, that will that's open part up of it. quite a few things for us, won't it? Yeah, and what we're actually <laughs> talking about in future videos, we're just stepping things up a little bit. Maybe you'll see that. Maybe you'll look at our future videos and go, I thought we were stepping it up. This is rubbish. <laughs> OK, we're moving into finance now. And the first question is a biggie from Phil Shaw. Can you give a breakdown of your investments with asset allocations and how this has changed over the last year? Also, are you considering relocating assets into safer assets like cash with what's going on? global economy so what's going on in the global economy there's actually another question on that coming up so i'm going to talk about that shortly so let's talk about this asset allocation a lot of people have asked us over the year or so we've had this channel mm -hmm. where have we got our money investing we've always been very circumspect about sharing such yeah. things but let's just get out in the open <laughs> when you look at asset allocation it can sometimes be simple you go well i've got 60% in equities and 40% in bonds. Any other questions? Well, actually, when you get to it, it's never that straightforward because Sarah's got money that she's built up over the years. I've got money I've built up over the years that some of it can't move because of X. Some of it I want in there because of Y. Mm. And actually, it gets really complicated. I'm going to tell you it all, and it's going to sound a bit complicated, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> the majority of our assets are in a Vanguard platform and in a Vanguard fund. And the fund that we choose is VWRL. So it's invested in over 7,000 companies across the globe. That's where 50% of our funds are in VWRL. We also have a life strategy fund, which is the life strategy 80, which means 80% equities, 20% bonds. So that gives us a little exposure to the bond market and also gives us a bit of a local bias to the UK because the, the life strategy fund on Vanguard UK does have a bit of a UK bias to it. Moving on from there, my last employer, I still have money in the pension scheme there. And that's because... I actually got a really good low-cost index fund there that is costing me less than Vanguard, yeah. which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I'm leaving unusual. that there. And also, <laughs> they have something which is called a come on, what's called, but it's a, it's a cash account effectively. So that's not open to risk from the markets yeah. or from bonds, and we treat that as yeah. a bond effectively. Mm -hmm. And they increase that in line with inflation every year, even though I'm not working there anymore. It's not a massive amount, but. That's there, it's and secure, we see that yeah. as our security mm -hmm. bond at yeah. the moment. This is all stored in SIPs, self-invested personal pension plans, and in ISAs, an individual savings account. And we also have money on hand for two years of travel. So we always start with two years, and that is to account for what happens in the marketplace, really. So we're sat at the moment with two years of money out of the markets, ready for us to spend that money and basically the way that we manage that is if markets have a bump up then we might transfer a bit more into that to keep it up if markets are going down then we won't move any money in we will hope that in the two-year frame the markets will um, come back to a level of stability again yeah. so that we can then reload it holly c how much do you pull from your portfolio every year and do you have an emergency fund so we don't have an emergency fund because, as I say, we have two years of money on hand. So if something happens, like we've, we've had to rush back to the UK urgently, not a problem. We've got that money on hand that we can call upon. So we don't need an emergency fund. That's effectively it. So we create a budget at the start of every year, which is dependent upon where we are planning to be. Where we're planning to be is also informing how we want to budget, if that makes sense. So, for example, if for the next 12 months we decided we wanted to go to uh, Switzerland, the US, Australia. Iceland and places <laughs> like that, we would have to budget greater. So we'll, we'll take a view before we start the year to say, do we want to keep it fairly tight or do we want to leave it open a little bit? And the reality on that is because we're in our early stages of retirement, we want to keep it tight. And then as we go through this 10 years, we see yeah. that we're going to kind of release the valve as, as yeah. we go through that. So that probably in year 10, we'll go to um, <laughs> All of those Switzerland countries we... and Iceland. <laughs> so and, much money we've got left. Uh, yeah, we, and, yeah <laughs> and, and work it from there. So our budget for this year and our year started in June, effectively, mm -hmm. our budget is £37,500, which, when we did that, gave us a US dollar 
value of £46,900. As we sit here today, the pound has tanked against the dollar, so £37,500 is now worth only US dollars So... Are we going to be going to the US anytime soon? <laughs> Potentially unlikely. Not unless that improves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Marsha Childs asks, in reference to taxes, how do you calculate how much you owe and how do you pay in the UK? This is nice and easy for us yep. at the moment because we've not yet hit a, an age by which we can take money from our retirement pots. Yeah. So we're not taking any money from retirement pots. We've got money in our individual savings accounts, which is like an IRA in the US. Mm -hmm. So there's no tax to pay as we remove from that. And the money that we're earning from YouTube is nowhere near <laughs> great enough for us to even think about. We dream yeah, of being we dream, taxed. But... Uh, we're actually meeting a fellow YouTuber next week who is a qualified tax expert. And we are interested to talk to him about the taxation options that we've got both from a YouTube perspective, that's why we're talking to him because yeah. he knows about He's the YouTube YouTuber. side of it, but also how do we structure things being internationally focused as we are. And Ian Smith asks some feedback on how you're managing in a world of high inflation, the fall in index funds, stock prices and market for ta volatility and how this affects your budgeting. Well, if you think that was tough, Sarah, three people have asked, <laughs> yes. asked questions that we're going to answer all as one. So tell okay. us what Den James and Ian Whitaker right. said as okay. well. We are, so Den James says, We are truly concerned looking at our investment pots this week and what this reckless government has managed to inflict on the nation. Never thought we could be run by such utter shambolic incompetence. You both must be thinking seriously about how bad this could get. You are both resilient and financially astute, but let's face it this could get far worse perhaps your views on this in your next update may be appreciated by some viewers trying to plan ahead good luck with everything <laughs> okay and here oh, to go. Go. sorry uh, some feedback on how you're managing in a no i read that one that's the same question we've got the same question twice effectively well i guess ian and, and yeah i think it was a similar the two ians yeah. asked it the same way <laughs> right let me answer it so Geo-arbitrage is the first thing, and we've yeah. touched on that in this video already, and we've actually got a series on geo-arbitrage, something a little bit mm. different, that we will probably be starting next week. Our government, yeah, they are incompetent, and the markets, the markets are all over the place. Let me tell you the thing about those two facts. It's normal. Our government is always incompetent, <laughs> And I think probably most governments around the world are incompetent. And I'll tell you why I believe that to be the case. And it's because that politics is all about short-termism. They've got five years in the UK when they're in power. So in those five years, in the first couple of years, they're going to try and do some clever stuff. By year three, they're already thinking about getting re-elected. They don't do long-term politics. I would love it if they did. And then the markets. Well, we are seeing unprecedented times, aren't we? And that's normal. Mm. I'm going to throw this up on screen so you can see exactly what I mean. What's happening at the moment is volatility. You're going to see it throughout your investing career. So what are we doing differently? Nothing other than the fact that we use geo-arbitrage as our, our lever to change things for us. So if, for example, things get really difficult with inflation, then we'll go to where it's cheapest. And we'll do something like that. But we're going to keep flexible from the geo-arbitrage perspective. But before we started our travel, we expected this. I've been mm. tracking the market as we've been saving our money. Yeah. I've seen our market go up and down and up and down over the years. Am I phased by what's happening? No. There may come a time where things get so bad that all we're really worried about is carrots and potatoes <laughs> yes, rather true. than money. Mm -hmm. If it gets to that, we'll probably be yeah. a bit challenged. And we'll make a video about that. We'll probably say, here are the top 10 dishes you can make <laughs> with a carrot and a potato. <laughs> but until then, we're not phased. And we don't want you to be phased. What you want to do is ensure that your psychology is right in line with your investment strategy. If this is too volatile for you, that means your investment strategy is too risky and you need to wind that down. Get those two working in parallel together and you'll be absolutely fine and we'll let these idiot politicians do whatever it is they've got to do. Phil Garner asks, hi both, from your corporate jobs do you have large gold-plated pensions that will amass you a lot of money in the background? 
we covered that a little while ago. So I think when you're talking gold plated in the UK, we would call that a final salary scheme or mm -hmm. a defined benefit scheme. Yeah. No, we don't have either of those. All the money that we have saved is money that we have saved and then we've invested and we use things like VWRL, rewind, look at that bit of the video, that's what we do. Nothing gold plated at all. And then we have the two Ians again, Ian Whitaker and Ian Smith, both on the same wavelength, aren't they? Yeah, they seem to be. Okay, Ian Whitaker, would you ever consider going back to work if needed? And Ian Smith, would you consider going back to work if needed, i.e. because of economic uncertainty? So we've factored this into our plan. We didn't retire on the basis that we're going to retire but we might return back if it all goes wrong. Our retirement plan was based upon geo-arbitrage. Could we have retired as early if we stayed in the UK, doing what we did, living in the house we lived? Probably not. No. That was part of our plan. So rather than returning back to the corporate workplace, we will more likely look at two factors that could change life for us. One would be by looking for a side gig so i guess yeah. youtube is a side mm -hmm. gig a side hustle yeah. look at another way of making money and also look at ways of saving money and for us that's geo arbitrage so i think i would more likely be doing a side hustle where yeah. things got really bad even that could be mowing lawns anything other than no, going back to corporate no. <laughs> well you would actually rather than go back to corporate and another question from rev and rob and they ask, what kind of drawdown strategy do you use and will you have to adapt it as you pivot from full-time travel in low-cost countries to living in the UK? That's a really good question and probably is something I could make a whole video around, mm. me just sat in front of, front of a spreadsheet. <laughs> and the way that we tackle this basically is really, I guess, around taxation and pots, really. So what I've done, and I've been doing this for 10 years, I would say, I've created a spreadsheet and that spreadsheet takes me from my age today or 10 years ago right up to the age of 93. Now you might think 93 is a bit of a strange place to stop. Why there? Well, it's because I was working on 93 and I thought the chances of me reaching it to 93 are so slim. The time I'm wasting no. on this spreadsheet <laughs> isn't of any value. So I'll just stop there. I could have stopped a bit earlier. I thought it was because you'd had a conference call or something because you did generally work on that spreadsheet yeah. rather than do it. Yeah, <laughs> that was while well, I had my day job. I was working on this spreadsheet. Yeah. But basically the way this spreadsheet is built up is it's got each year going along. So it'll have 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, right the way up to the age of 93. And... We're using my age as I'm the oldest, so obviously Sarah's tracking along behind me <laughs> nicely. And then for each one of those years, I've got each pot of cash along the side. And then we are draining those pots of cash in line with what's right to do from a tax taxation perspective. So in the UK, when I hit the age of 67, we start to get the old age pension. And that will obviously give us a bump in input income, but also at the same time, it will bump us closer to taxation or, or paying more tax. So we drain those pots bit by bit as we go through the years, and we do it alongside a guardrail principle. So we're not using the 4% rule, we're using guardrails to take us through from here up to the age of 93. We have it as a forecast and then we put the actuals in for that year and we forecast forward from there and then we put the actuals and then we re-forecast. That's basically the process. Yeah. If this is a video that's of interest then do let us know because it's going to be a really dry video to make. <laughs> and aren't we also tackling this very question next week? We are. We, we're tackling this to an extent around the geo-arbitrage yeah. side and how you can manage your finances better in a geo-arbitrage environment. That's going to be a mm. really interesting video and something no one else has made <laughs> before. This is very, very different and a bit unique and a bit daft. Yes. Very Neil and Sarah, I could say. <laughs> we're really interested to know what you're doing with your drawdown strategies and what you're doing with the current volatility in the market are you making changes let us know in the comments below really hope you've enjoyed this video we've enjoyed making it we've enjoyed making it on a brand <laughs> it's new good camera to be back. yes new camera. fantastic mm. we'll see you next time bye, bye for now laurie thornton asks us laurie thornton asks us <laughs> what kind of drawdown draw down strategy oh, <laughs> and another question from Rev and Rob. No, say it to the camera.